What's up, guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle John, where we pluck stories from Reddit and around the web that mainly interest me, but also hopefully interest you. Tales from Tech Support, Malicious Compliance, Am I the A-Hole? And today, we are doing Tales from the Squad Car. It's been a while. We've had a couple people ask about it. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of those subreddits that just doesn't get a ton of good stories. So hopefully today's episode... Well, hello. Don't step on the keyboard. So hopefully today's episode will fill the gap. So hopefully today's episode will uh, fulfill the need to hear about stupid criminals. <laughs> okay, can you do something here? Go this way. Listen, your thing is showing in the camera. Can you like move? Ding dong. All right, we'll give it a shot. From a bystander, train passenger ends up in custody because they wouldn't take their feet off the seats. Back in the late 80s, the NSW government, oh, New South Wales, Australia, introduced a class of police officer called Transit Police to focus on safety on the public transport network, particularly trains. Were we boring you? A lot of people assumed they were glorified ticket inspectors with no real powers. Those people were wrong. I was traveling on a Sydney train around that time, and a guy sitting near us had his boots up on the facing seat. A transit cop walking through the carriage politely asked him to take his feet off the seat, which would have been the end of it. Instead, the guy just arced up with a string of profanity and tries to start a fight. Quick radio call from the transit cop, and he has backup from another carriage, and old mate is in cuffs and getting his ID checked. From what we overheard on the radio and what the cop said to him, he has at least two outstanding warrants for missed court attendances and possibly other stuff. So instead of just taking his feet off the seat, he's going to jail over outstanding warrants plus new charges for assault and resisting arrest. How incredibly stupid. How, how, could, you, how could you be that dumb? You know, it's one thing to, you know, want to assert yourself, be assertive and, you know, but then to be just outright aggressive and ignorant, especially when you have warrants <laughs> for failure to appear. That's just dumb. And even if he didn't have failure to appear, he still would have got resisting and obstruction and something else, probably. I mean, Australia is not that much different than the U.S., although their uh, FSTs, their field sobriety tasks, are non-existent uh we're the only country really in the world that does the song and dance uh as uh as radical would say the dance of dipshittery um so uh, there's a reason for it we're a very litigious society over here and they need every bit of probable cause and uh evidence that they can get including visual audible like you know the way they speak and everything else so there's reasons for doing it it seems a little monotonous and mundane, and you don't, as a citizen, keep this in mind, you don't have to do those field sobriety tests. But you, once you're out of the car, you're pretty much, you're getting hooked up at one way or the other by the time, you know, you're done your interaction there on the street. You're getting locked up. Uh, the only difference is, you know, you don't have to do field sobriety tests and, you know, further give them probable, more probable cause or more evidence. The only thing in most states, I'd have, I haven't heard of anywhere you don't have to do the breath test or urine or blood, depending on the state. Um, most of the time, a, a breath test back at the station. That is the one that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the one that you legally signed and agreed for when you got your license. If you don't take that, now you get the OVI or DWI charge, as well as failure to comply with the breath test and usually that means a one-year suspension maybe loss of your tags not usually though although a lot of prosecutors anymore just drop the cases or make them so minimal that really it's a slap on the wrist so i don't know anyway long ramble from an officer crazy man grabs a hostage while i'm chasing him so i'm on patrol and i get called out to a business because there's a guy using drugs in front when I get there, the guy's walking away, so I let him go, but there are two other homeless guys sleeping in front of the business. I ask the two guys to leave because I know I'm going to get a call from them later, so I'll figure I'll just handle it now. I'm totally cool with the guys, and I ask them to leave. So the two guys start packing up. One of them starts walking away. Then he chucks an object, which I thought was a rock but turned out to be a vape pen, at the glass door of the business. Well, I thought the object cracked the window when he threw it. It turned out later to just be a scuff mark. So I figured, you know, that's not cool. He can't just damage someone's property like that. So I decided to detain him for vandalism. I tell the guy to stop, but he doesn't want to stop. 
He runs away. I chase him. He runs down the street. Oh, see Dick run. See Jane run. But I'm gaining on him. Up ahead, there's a lady and her two kids crossing the street. So the guy runs around behind the lady and her kids, grabs the lady, and starts punching her in the face. I'm like, holy shit, I wasn't expecting that. So I grab the guy and start punching him in the face. We all fall to the ground, and after about 10 seconds, I'm able to pry the guy off of her. The case goes to court, and I, of course, get accused of excessive force and causing the whole fiasco. The guy's trial ends in a hung jury, despite the whole thing being captured on video. We're going to trial again in a few weeks, so we'll see. See what I mean? Hung jury. What? Why is there a hung jury? First of all, I mean, none of us, I don't think any of us have seen the actual footage of this happening, but in all reality, the guy was asked to stop. He was probably going to get a ticket, a citation, and be let go because the jails are too full anyway and, you know, it's just not worth trying to actually book him into jail. But he was going to get detained, get cited for vandalism, and actually, if the cop had inspected it and saw it was just a scuff mark, probably would have just let him go with nothing. But the guy turned it into something that it wasn't. He was now fleeing. Now the cop has to chase because you can't just flee. You have to you have to stop. It was a lawful order. And then grabbing a hold of a lady and, you know, I don't know if he was trying to hold her hostage or what. I'm not sure why he was taking out his frustration on her. You would have thought he would just, you know, grabbed and held on to her as like a shield. No, he actively started punching her. Well, at that point, the cop has every right to do whatever it takes to get this guy off of the other citizen. So I don't know. Sounds like this cop got the raw end of the deal on this one, but whatever. Life would just be so much simpler if people would not break the law. Tony Romo and the Lizard King. This is from a deputy. My first few years in law enforcement, I worked at a sheriff's office in Florida with about 350 sworn deputies. We had a mixture of rural and urban areas and a large city police department that was around the same size as us, as well as several 20-man city departments for the smaller towns in the county. I was also in a college town, so occasionally we had some effed up calls with those idiots. Sounds like Gainesville. Maybe. I'm working patrol one night, and it's the usual fare for a Saturday. Domestics, shots fired, traffic problems, street racing. My shift had a ritual. When it got to around 4.30 or so in the morning, a few of us who weren't tied up would go to this 24-hour breakfast joint and do our reports at a table in the back room and shoot the crap. This night I had a trainee who was pretty legit. He was doing well, was in fourth phase, which is essentially the I'm here for backup, handle your business phase. As soon as I order my chocolate chip pancakes, we hear the dreaded beep 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 tone that means either something serious is happening or a citizen heard a possum outside and called in that they were being burgled. My trainee jumps out of his seat and hauls ass towards the car. So I'm like, well, I guess we're going to this one, whatever it is. Callers reported a man running northbound in the southbound lanes of a major highway. There's several more calls asking us to step it up because there's already one single vehicle crash. We get on scene and I'm looking around and everything seems pretty normal at first until I catch some movement in my peripheral vision in the bushes by the Howard Johnson. I shine my flashlight across the road and I see a flash of skin. I start carefully making my way across the road and I see a head poking out of the bushes. I challenge him, and my trainee pulls his taser and starts shrieking in a high-pitched voice for him to get out of the bushes. <laughs> the guy says, I can't, because Tony Romo. I get closer and now can see he's sitting Indian style in the bushes. He's also very, very naked and sweaty. Ew. We try to coax him out of the bushes, and he jumps up and yells, I am the Lizard King, and starts sprinting down the sidewalk and into the highway again. He takes off, wearing nothing but tennis shoes and not a stitch else. My trainee looks at me like, Ugh. And I'm like, go get him. He's going to get killed. So he chases the guy down with me behind him and tackles a dude in the median and cuffs him up. By this time, the entire shift is there because they heard there was a naked dude. <laughs> Even the supervisors. It's also 5 a.m. now and we get off at 6 a.m. So I'm pissed. We sit the dude down in the median cuffed in the front because he's obviously not dangerous after interacting with him. And he's picking things off the ground and eating them. <laughs> and talking about how Tony Romo is one of the Illuminati and how he's one of the lizard overlords. He wasn't just sweaty either. He was covered in some sort of lubricant and smelled like solvent. Oh my God. I talked to the lieutenant and I'm like, this dude ain't going to be accepted in the jail. The nurse will laugh us out of the place. He's like, yeah, what do you think? I'm like, hospital 100%. Let them deal with this. Put him in the back of my car and we'll take him to the ER. Security is glaring at us as we bring this naked dude wearing a blanket we keep for people in shock. Place him on a 72-hour mental health hold and take off. My trainee looks hollow-eyed and like he's seen a ghost. I'm like, dude, first naked guy? He's like, yep, hopefully last naked guy. 
Naked dude gets admitted and I'm only 45 minutes late getting off. Turns out he was on mushrooms and ketamine. Ah. And he had covered himself in a mixture of gasoline and KY jelly. Not the strangest call I had that week. That story's for another time. It involved burglars supposedly breaking into a man's house and manually stimulating him in his sleep. <laughs> and also planting cameras on his horde of cockroaches that were literally living with him in his house. Ugh. This is just one of the many reasons that I stayed away from law enforcement of any type. At one point in time, I started the endeavor of, you know, going through the application process and getting interviewed by a very intense detective to become a corrections officer. And uh, I got 95% through the process and then decided, you know what? I've already worked in the public school system. And this can't be any better. Just more violence and probably more drugs. Maybe. And I just don't want to deal with that. Naked people, throwing feces, doing all kinds of nasty stuff, attacking people, uh, attacking each other, attacking guards. Uh, and then just the, the overall drama and craziness of it. My life's crazy enough without that. Gasoline and KY Jelly. That's sort of like a poor man's napalm, it sounds like. <laughs> Jeez. From an officer, drunk decides to be a butthead, earns two plus weeks in jail instead of zero. Y'all liked my last story, so I thought I'd tell another that happened recently. This is the tale of Jose, a man who allowed pride to get the best of him. Pride and booze. Officer Sleepy is on his way back to the station to end his shift. The last thing he wants is to get tied up with the nonsense when he's about to head home. But when Officer Sleepy sees Jose is driving like he's blindfolded, he does the right thing and pulls him over. As soon as the window opens, Officer Sleepy gets blasted in the face by the smell of beer. Jose is looking cross-eyed, can barely see the alphabet or count to save his life. Officer Sleepy runs Jose through SFSTs. Jose is confused why he had to keep doing more tests. He's certain he nailed every one. Spoiler alert, he did not. Officer Sleepy places Jose under arrest for one of the most obvious OVIs of his career. Jose is deeply indignant. He's not a criminal. He doesn't have guns. He did all the tests perfectly. He's done nothing wrong. Of course, they never do anything wrong. I didn't do nothing. Now here's the thing you need to know about many big city agencies, including the one for which Officer Sleepy works. People arrested for OVIs are almost never taken to jail the night of their arrest anymore. They're given a court date and taken someplace safe. Officer Sleepy asks Jose for his information. Jose decides he's not going to go with the program and lies. He says he's the registered owner of the car. Unfortunately for Jose, police can actually look up DMV photos and clearly see that that's not him. Officer Sleepy asks what his real name is. Jose stays silent. Officer Sleepy gives Jose one more chance. If you give us your ID info, you'll go home tonight with a ticket and a court date. But if you don't ID yourself as required by law, we will charge you with failing to ID. And I promise that you will spend the weekend in jail. And we will ID you anyway. Well, Jose is too proud or drunk or stupid or some combination thereof and decides that's fine. Take me to jail. I'll spend two or three days in there, no problem. Officer Sleepy took Jose to the ID unit to have him fingerprinted, where his name and info was discovered. After spending hours there and finishing paperwork, Jose was slated in jail about four hours after the traffic stop, about three hours after Officer Sleepy was supposed to leave for home. Well, despite being a big city where many people are released on recognizance bonds, even for violent crimes, apparently the court is not happy with Jose either for some reason. He was arraigned and given a large bond, which he couldn't pay. Jose is spending his 17th birthday in jail as I write this. He has court again soon where he may be released, if perhaps he can show a bit of humility before the judge. In the end, all he had to do was give up his name and he wouldn't have even spent a single night in jail. Part of me wants to see him again so I can ask him if it was worth it. Officer Sleepy, out of service. I just don't understand. There's a whole thing, you know, and it's not just sob sits anymore. There's a bunch of people who are sort of this weird in-between mutt between regular law-abiding citizen and sob sit where they think, or Moorish, where they think that they don't have to ID, they don't have to cooperate, they don't have to give you their name, uh, they don't have to answer any questions, of course, but, you know, there are certain things that you do have to do in these processes sure you can fail to identify no problem but there are consequences you know you're not consequence free why be a pain in the ass just for the sake of being a pain in the ass follow along with the program get done sooner because you were going to get that ticket for ovi no matter what now you're just stacking charges legit charges too i mean come on this is from a passenger in the suspect's car Oof. 
I've always wondered what a cop would say that I should have done differently. It was shortly after the start of the first date, blind date set up by a new work colleague. He was driving us to the restaurant. I have no idea why specifically he fled, he just told me he was wanted and took off. This was a couple decades ago. I didn't have a cell phone, I was in my early 20s and naive, and I'd recently moved to San Francisco and didn't know the city at all. They pursued, he lost them during a terrifying chase by suddenly ducking down a residential street, pulling into an empty driveway, turning off the motor and pushing me to the floor, then laying on top of me with his hand over my mouth. Ugh, scary. I saw several sets of lights go by several times and we laid there for a long time before he let me up. He said he wasn't afraid I'd scream, that he'd only put his hand over my mouth so I wouldn't hyperventilate and fog the windows, which made me think that this wasn't the first time he'd run. I considered jumping out of the car and banging on someone's door, but I had no idea where I was or what kind of neighborhood it was. And then he said he'd been really scared of getting caught because he had a gun under the seat. I asked him to take me home, and amazingly, he did. I never heard from him again. My work colleague claimed he never saw him again either, and that he didn't know why he was wanted, though they'd been high school buddies. During the chase, I was far more frightened that we'd crash or hit someone than I was of being caught, because I didn't know what he'd done, and I was totally naive about police interactions. Since then, I've seen enough footage of police chases and read enough news stories to feel fear for anyone who is an unwilling or unwitting passenger in a chase. I couldn't even imagine being a passenger and all of a sudden we got lights behind us and a guy takes off that's driving the car. That would just freak me right out. Not sure how well I'd deal with him trying to hold me down and keep my mouth shut either. Probably bite him, but whatever. Of course, nobody knows until they're in the actual situation what they would really do, but uh, I'm not sure I would have asked him for a ride home after that either. <laughs> I probably would have said, listen, you have a good night doing whatever you're doing with your police friends out there. I'm going to get out and go home. I don't care if I knew the area or not. Now, nah, being a female back then, who knows? Maybe it was different, but I know how I would do it, I guess. From an officer, what not to do before fleeing. Let's call him Jim. Jim ran a red light. Jim got pulled over. Jim is polite and respectful. Jim hands over his ID, insurance, provides his current address and phone number. Jim's lady friend in the front seat even hands over her ID, unprompted. Officer runs Jim. Jim has a warrant for petty theft from a neighboring jurisdiction. Officer returns to Jim and tells him he has a warrant and needs to step out of the car. Jim says, what? I have a warrant? Then proceeds to put his car in gear and take off with two-year-old Jim Jr. in the back without a car seat. Luckily for Jim, the agency pursuit policy prevents officers from following him. Unlucky for Jim, officers know exactly who he is and where he lives. Officers proceed to file warrants for six charges against Jim. The warrants also serve to trigger an automatic violation of his probation. The funny thing is there was only a $300 bond on the petty theft charge. He probably would have been released immediately if he could pay it. The even funnier thing is that warrant was no longer even in the NCIC the next day meaning it probably wouldn't have even been good. He would have been handcuffed, the warrant verified, and if no good, released immediately. The next day, Jim's lady friend called asking for her ID. Sorry lady, it was mailed to the DMV, but she confirmed that the address Jim so kindly provided was a good one. A couple hours later, the officers from whom Jim fled paid him a visit. Now Jim is in jail, serving the remainder of his previously suspended 180 days for the probation violation, plus whatever the new charges bring. Jim is dumb. Don't be like Jim exactly what I'm talking about. People react out of fear of going to jail or consequences when in reality, they're just stacking up more consequences. It just doesn't make sense to me. Fight or flight is a real thing and I get that, but you gotta know that deep down there's gotta be some rational part of your brain that says, you know, don't do this dummy, you're gonna get in more trouble. You would think. From a deputy, a tale of management. Our agency, a rural county with approximately 40 sworn deputies, we added some of our guys to a joint tactical team with a neighboring county to share resources. That's all great. However, the shit show that followed is not. I feel laying my qualifications and experience here is necessary. I shoot. A lot. In 2022, I filled two 5-gallon buckets with 5.56 brass alone. 2023 was two buckets again, but mixed 9mm 5.56. All on my own time and dime. I shoot IPSC, US... PCA, probably not much longer since the BOD drama, two-thirds gun, precision rifle, etc., etc. On top of that, I'm the agency's firearms instructor, armorer, tactics, and local gun guru guy. I was asked to draw up a document for several new rifles for the guys assigned to the TAC team, so I provided several quality rifle manufacturers, BCM, ADM, MI, Munitions Works, DD, Geisel, 
Gosley, Geisley, whatever, etc. Suppressor options, Surefire, Griffin, etc. Optic packages, recommendations on specific things like barrel lengths, optic mount heights, etc. All said and done, the only work management had to do was follow my recommendations and our guys would have received excellent rifles. What followed was, and still continues to be, a royal pain in my ass. Management decided to go with a local to us manufacturer. The rifles provided were, as I wrote in an email, absolutely unacceptable for use in any capacity. What was so bad? Guns were overgassed. Not by a little. Way over. Gas keys not staked. Improper buffer weights for suppressed guns. Proprietary rails. I can't get them off. Loose parts from the manufacturing. Bent firing pins. Slanted bolt tails, aka crooked. Improperly cut feed ramps. Failures to feed. Failures to fire. Fails to eject. 10 and a half inch mystery barrels, muzzle brakes, not flash hiders, trigger rests and fall issues, poorly mounted optics, Vortex 1 6SE, don't know what that is, and laughable accuracy. I spent no less than 500 rounds of my own ammo troubleshooting these rifles to figure out their problems. I also compiled hundreds of pictures, video, and slow-mo to document these issues. This was all then provided to management. What, you may ask, was this company's response to our issues with their rifles? One, there's a break-in period. <laughs> Two, download your mags to 28 rounds. Three, your armorer is an idiot. Four, when we tested the rifles, they worked fine. Number five, they meet accuracy standards. So what I've learned here and what I'm hoping everyone can take away for this is simple. You can be the end-all expert on a topic in your agency. When management asks for your opinion or suggestion on a topic, I now ask them this. Are you asking me for a factual data-driven experience-based recommendation or are you just asking me to make it seem like you're pondering options? These rifles are in service with our agency still. Thankfully, I have rectified all the issues and they have been great performers since. However, the cost associated with fixing a lesser product has now surpassed what it would have been with a reputable manufacturer. And to end on a positive note, our agency cut ties with said local manufacturer and bought a bunch of BCM 11.5s for, for patrol. Small win, just cost me a lot of headaches. Be safe and stay steady. I don't know a ton about firearms and rifles, but what I do know in general, not all the time, but most of the time you get what you pay for. There are quality manufacturers out there who sell no frills rifles and they're a good solid platform. They don't have as many bells and whistles that can be added on later as some of the other manufacturers uh, because of some proprietary stuff. But basically here's the bottom line. When you're relying on somebody to be your expert in your agency, your company, whatever it is, Listen to the guy. There's a reason you pay him. If you're not willing to listen to him, then why have him there at all? Just throw whatever, you know, throw whatever in there and see see what works, see what doesn't. And then you'll end up in a, you know, shit show where things start jamming up at the most critical times and whatever. It's just, it's just dumb. I don't know if this analogy equates or not, but basically I could go frame a house with a rock as my hammer. Yeah, I could get those nails driven. It'll take me 10 times longer. I'll bend a lot more nails, waste a lot of precious resources and time. The wood will look like crap from any misses or when I'm sinking the nail because, you know, the rock isn't as accurate. It, why use the rock? Yeah, it's cheap and you can find a rock pretty much anywhere. But the hammer is going to work so much better. It just, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. While we think about how wrong I am, do me a favor. Visit this website down here and maybe click some of those buttons down below. Till the next video, we'll see you.